Okay, hello everybody. Welcome. Um, my name is Miles. I'm here from Books Against Borders. Uh, we are a collective education group, collective yeah, political education group looking at readings, uh, abolitionist, anti-racist, anti-colonial, anti-capitalist literature. And we're really happy today to be able to sit down with Luke Thanolonia and Gracie May Bradley. Thank you so much for coming. Um, yeah. Uh, do, again, as I say, do feel free to say hi, say where you're from in the chat, um, or where you are, and how you're handling heat wave. Yeah, and we're going to be talking today about Against Borders, the case for abolition, which is out through Verso Books tomorrow, what's already in store, um, some places, I believe. Uh, Gracie Mo Bradley uh, is a campaigner and policy expert uh, and former director of human rights NGO Liberty. Uh, she's a founding member of the grassroots campaign Against Borders for Children, and her writing can be found in The Guardian, Vice, Open Democracy, Galdem, and many other interesting places, uh, and in the collection of the Grenfell uh, Violence, Resistance, and Response from Pluto Press. A really powerful essay there. Uh, Luke is a lecturer in race, ethnicity, and post-colonial studies at the Sarah Parker Raymond Center at UCL. Uh, as well as co-authoring Against Borders, Luke's book, Deporting Black Britain's Portraits of Deportation to Jamaica, was published in 2020 with Manchester Unique Press. And he was one of the co-authors of Empire's Endgame, Racism and the British State, published by Pluto in 2021. Another two excellent reads as well. Um, yeah, and really, Big thanks to them, to you both for coming today, and thank you everybody else for coming here. So just to give a little intro today again, we will be going through a couple of questions to talk about the book and then opening this up for Q&A. We really want everybody to get involved. If you have any questions, you know, do feel free to speak up. It'd be lovely to hear lots of interesting thoughts and questions and comments for the authors. Um, yeah, I'll be starting off. Uh, just. This book, uh, Against Borders, is really such a useful tool for our times, uh, as the realities of the wide-reaching border regime and its effects can feel really overwhelming and suffocating, sometimes literally suffocating when we have you know, the effects of a climate crisis that is so inextricably linked to the border regime. Um, yet, simultaneously, resistance is being shown everywhere from members of the public and activists taking action to resist immigration raids, to the overwhelming outpouring of solidarity and of outrage during the fight against uh, the first planned flight to Rwanda last month here in the UK. Uh, and we see similar outrage and resistance all over the world. Against Borders really ties together the overt violence of border militarism and the many nefarious ways in which bordering technologies and narratives have been weaved through modern society in a way that shows how this resistance and so many other forms of it are important while reminding us of the challenges that we face. So Luke and Gracie, I'd just like to start off with asking what brought you to a kind of politics of abolition and the decision to write this book together and that whole process. It's funny being virtual because we can't like mutter to each other and decide who's going to take which bit. I'm like trying to give Luke a visual cue and it's impossible. Um, what I was going <laughs> to what I was going to say, Luke, was do you want to talk about abolition, maybe? And I'll talk about how we got to write in the book together. And yes. you, you want to go first? That makes sense. Yeah, I'll go first. Um, how I came to abolition, I think it probably applies for both of us. Um, I'd been working academically and kind of outside the academy with in Bristol actually um, with migrants and refugees in the asylum system people who were signing at reporting centers which is where you go to um, to report to the home office because you've got some kind of temporary status or provisional status and where lots of people are detained so I started doing that I was you know hanging out with people 
and thinking through the asylum system and also studying about racism and anti-racism in, in, in Bristol. Um, and from there, I've kind of always found most compelling, most interesting and um, kind of most resonant with what I had uh, thought in bringing these two bodies of literature together, radical anti-racism and the left and people in the asylum system that I knew just, just local to me, was the politics of no borders, the politics, particularly my PhD supervisor, who some of you will know as kind of people studying and thinking about borders, it was Bridget Anderson, um, who'd written a paper about no borders. And so I was always kind of, um, and I think Gracie too, taken by trying to find a politics which supports migrant rights, but one which works for all migrants, all people in the system, not just those who uh, can be placed into one particular, you know, um, provisional category, or those who are seen to be especially deserving. Um, and so I think the politics of the radical broad argument before we came to abolition as a frame for the book, which we'll talk about a little bit more, I think the broad impulse that brings me and Gracie together is one in which the kind of liberal politics of reformism is wholly unsatisfactory. And that's a politics where what you need to try and do is put everyone in the right boxes. You don't really have time to ask unrealistic big questions about why we have these countries in the first place, the inequalities between them, um, and what we say about those you know, groups of people who might come into that refugee centre uh, and not have a particularly strong asylum claim under the terms of the law, uh, who have committed a criminal offence, uh, who aren't particularly well educated and qualified to do particular jobs that are required in the economy or unwilling to do the ones at the bottom where they're, where they're given a place. Um, and I think it's that kind of refusal of that, you know, what we call, I think we call it dreary and dismal. We, 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 use a, we whip out a lot of adjectives to describe the pol liberal politics of reformism because we have quite a few pages. Um, and I think that that, that dissatisfaction is the, is, the, is the starting point, obviously. And then also, as you opened out with, a hope about the possibility of radical political formations that they could be expanded, that we could relate to each other in other ways, that we could um, kind of build out from those spaces where we feel like we do see one another and where we might flourish. Um, and that's where I think we came to the politics of abolition. So I'll let Gracie go from there, maybe a bit about what we found so generative about abolition theoretically and specifically and also you know the process yeah thanks luke um i think one of the things that we found really interesting and generative about abolition was the kind of demand for us to think abolition demands that we think about the world that we want to live in and what we want to build towards um because ruthie gilmore you know she tells us abolition is about presence as well as absence and so I think abolition really helps you to get beyond, we don't want this, this is harmful, this is terrible. Um, it really challenges us to think, how might we remake the world and our relationships to one another so that these carceral harmful practices and institutions just aren't needed anymore? Like how do we transform the conditions to which these things are a response? And I think that that's a real challenge when it comes to thinking about border abolition because it's requiring us to think beyond the nation state. It's requiring us to think, well, how might different communities that might be really distant from one another, that might be familiar or no unknown to one another, how might they relate? How might we relate to each other in ways that don't involve, you know, walls and surveillance and caging and exclusion and so on? So I think it was that, it's that demand for us to think about the world that we want to build towards that's really generative in abolition and I think for me personally I suppose I've been in a lot of kind of left-wing spaces where sort of you can have the sort of you know fuck the police stance but you still haven't thought about how do we deal with harm that happens in this group between one another and abolition really doesn't let you off the hook um, because it's about all of us remaking those relationships from the very micro to the very macro um, you know, if we think calls to kind of abolish the police or abolish borders without thinking about how we want the world to be or how we're going to respond to or transform harm, are, you know, pretty irresponsible. So I think that's what we find really generative about abolition. Um, and in terms of actually how we came to writing the book, um, as Luke says, we had kind of had synergies in, in our work and in our thought for a while um, that were kind of visible. We'd been on panels together, riffing off similar themes, particularly that theme against innocence. I actually think one of the first panels that we were on together was that, I've forgotten the name of the conference, but it's the one that Abolitionist Futures 
organized. It was like the big prison conference a few years ago. We were on that panel with Adam Elliott Cooper and Derek Pennell. I think that's where we first met. Um, and we'd kind of both been talking to Verso separately anyway, but I think there was just a really interesting question for us in what if we did this together? Um, we come from quite different sort of disciplines and ways of thinking. Um, you know, Luke, it, Luke has his PhD as an academic, he's, you know, he's a rigorous and good teacher. And I've been in NGOs for a long time. We've both kind of done grassroots activist stuff. So that's generative because we work actually in quite different ways in some ways. Um, and some of you will have seen that Luke tweeted, uh, you know, a week or so ago, the little screenshot of me texting him saying, Luke, should we write a book? And him saying, Gracie, great idea. What should we write a book about? And me going, should be about why there shouldn't be any borders. That's where it started. Um, and we spent a long time working on our vision and working on the proposal. We took that to Verso and we had imagined this wonderful halcyon time of going to the British Library together on Fridays, maybe doing some traveling, engaging with, you know, art and cinema and really dreaming together. And the pandemic happened. So the way the book was written unfolded in a way that we didn't necessarily envisage. I think what's been so lovely about the tour actually is that we've finally been able to spend some of the time together that we hoped we would spend all that time ago. Um, but yeah, here we are. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to say, Miles, was just thanks to you, because I really think that Books Against Borders is a wicked resource. And I really appreciate what you did in pulling the reading list together because we were always really clear that we weren't trying to like trademark border abolition and say that it was ours and it was new. Like we really want to acknowledge all of the different places that it's come from in literature and in movement. So for you to have situated us within that wider literature and pointed people towards all the other amazing reading that there is, is just, um, is really appreciated. Thank you. Um, and yeah, thank, thank you both. Um, and thank you both for writing this book. I think that it does that really well. And I think, you know, that tying together an existing tradition and transposing a much longer tradition of abolition applied to the prison industrial complex and beyond, you know, part of what makes this book so effective as a tool, you know, for, for activists, for campaigners, for academics, and for, for everybody is that it kind of does present those windows into a very kind of wide range of fields and of areas, spaces of resistance, right, sites um, where, where resistance is possible. Um, I want to pick up on, you know, you spoke about, you know, seeing the limits of and the challenges of an approach to, you know, so many of the issues around migrant rights and beyond uh, the issue of the nation state and how that will always kind of cause, you know, it's so much what organizing or existing organizing has been dependent on as a kind of, this is what's going to help us in, in a fairly unhelpful way. And, and you write towards the end of the, bo the book, uh, our greatest challenge is to cultivate a radically open-ended imagination about how to enact various forms of political struggle beyond and against the treacherous allure of citizenship. Um, I'm going to have a treacherous allure. Um, one of the most important takeaways from the book for me was the approach to citizenship that you take throughout. Um, you know, looking at its ties to race and race making regimes, to heteropatriarchal conceptions of the family, its revocability and fragility, uh, and its limitations as a solution to the violence of the border more broadly. Such a move away from citizenship as an institution and indeed from the nation state is a tremendous and you know, necessary shift. I'm intrigued as to the pathways you see to that type of world making, because it is world making, right? Um, and it can't just happen within one nation state, because then there's that whole problem again. So where do you see this type of move potentially occurring? I guess I'll direct it more, Luke, if that helps, but do feel free to. Yeah, 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 no, I think in general, both Gracie and I probably, when our, when we've heard our voice for too long, need the other one to take take over. So that's a good order in general. Um, yeah, there's a lot there's a lot there in what you said, and I think we can start maybe uh, before we come to some of the points 
you know, well, one of the things is a more general kind of theoretical question about relation about the nation state, the problem of the nation state, the relationship between citizenship and racism and how we think about those things. And in a way, um, getting some of them down in some of the chapter towards the beginning race, we have chapters, race, gender, capitalism. I think getting some of that stuff down was what we also wanted to do. And that's the kind of groundwork that we think is useful for people to read, discuss, print off, have a reading group about. But of course, that's also an attempt to kind of uh, summarize some of the critical literature. Like I mentioned, Bridget Anderson, you know, Nadine Elanani recently wrote a book on colonialism and, and immigration control and the history of Britain in particular. Other scholars from North America have written about border imperialism, etc. Ahasha Walia, of course, who's also widely read by people who are um, kind of organizing and activists, but thinking about, you know, reading books together. So we wanted to we felt that was necessary to have as a foundation. And in a way that sets up a critique of the nation state system, of its colonial prehistory, of the fact that immigration, and I think I say this in every talk I give to you know, students of any age about immigration control, that we need to give even just a cursory sketch of the history of the modern world. And then we might feel slightly differently about the claim that, you know, even kind of consensus claims like immigration controls aren't racist, right? But that gives us an interesting starting point if we link about the history of nation states and the inequalities between them. Um, more two points to, to pick out of other things you said, and then I'll let Gracie go. One, I suppose, is that it's interesting that you picked up the citizenship question, because I think um, that's come up in some of the previous events we've done. We've done a couple last week. Um, that question of... Um, what it means to be against citizenship and perhaps to reject a, or not to reject but to question a politics of trying to get people citizenship and what that opens up and what we might want instead and i'll i'll leave grace to talk a bit about those non-reformist reforms but in that chapter on abolition that i really think um it was gracie's vision and kind of uh, first outlines that got us there to that chapter in which we kind of copy basically versions of uh, qu questions to ask to think through which abolitionist non-reformist reforms are, 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 are the right ones to pursue from kind of prison abolitionists elsewhere, uh, critical resistance, Maria Macaba, um, and that we kind of wanted to try and have a go at that for a short chapter. Um, and that one starts with what I think is the kind of juiciest, the most interesting, which is about whether we should fight for uh, to, to get more people into the citizenship box um, and whether that's reformist or non-reformist. I don't think we have a hard line. And obviously we know that if people we care about uh, or people who are trying to um, get some security for themselves or people in there or, or for groups, that it's very useful for them to get citizenship as opposed to being threatened with deportation all the time. Um, but we ask a longer term question about trying to get amnesties and citizenship versus trying to lower uh, the capacity of the state to detain, deport, raid, illegalize. Uh, because we think that the the politics of citizenship doesn't really have any answers for all those that fall outside. And as someone myself who's thought a lot about people with criminal offences, Gracie has too, along with thinking about people, um, you know, in, in the context of criminality, but also in the context of counter-terror policy. Uh, we found those unsatisfactory. And so we asked that big question. People will have to read the book and discuss it among themselves to, to see what they think. Because I do think it's a, there's obviously kind of, strategic questions in particular places the nuts and bolts of this is 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 to be worked out in the doing i guess and so whether it's worth fighting for an amnesty sort of depends um, on how it's related to other things and the government in power etc um and in some ways it's we we always want the thing to be less terrible so so these questions aren't straightforward and we're not being kind of hardline about it um the, the final thing on world making that's that's a massive question and maybe we'll come to some more to pick out some of that in in the q a maybe people want to contribute as well with comments about where they see uh the force and the logic of the border starting to fall apart and starting to lose hold and i think that the best answer we've got i suppose is those planetary internationalist moments of shared conviction towards a broad goal which you can see in global upsurge of anti-racist movements questioning of police power um, environmental movements if they're going to work have to work at that scale and yet also a kind of ordinary way in which the whole of the nation and the nation state falls apart at very local levels like being you know a mancunian or um someone who's from hackney and that's kind of the way they identify with people who have lots of other points of connections but in which the kind of fixed politics of a 
you know, nation state under assault from without doesn't really make any sense. Um, and trying to kind of trying to expand out from those and build political constituencies out of people for whom more local and more global identifications have a greater hold over what they care about, which I think is loads of us, um, doesn't mean it's, it's easy to build out from them. I actually don't think I have loads more to add, Luke, really. Yeah. Oh, very excellent compliment. Um, yeah, we previously discussed some of these questions in, in previous reading groups where we discussed border and rule, um, or we read border and rule quite a while ago, and yeah, we really brought up a lot of those questions. Uh, and you know, dealing with that kind of immediate short term solution of, of you know, this does help some people out, but yeah, going into that broader questions, there is also the Onga uh, currently ongoing uh, abolition geography reading group that I see a few people here are involved in, um, which if anybody would like to post the link in the chat to, uh, that's great, which also deals with some of these questions, not necessarily specifically at that citizenship level, but thinking about place and the way that we identify with different places and how much that comes, you know, the formative role that that has in our conceptions of freedom and all of that is just, yeah, again. In the Q and A section, really do encourage people to add their comments. They're far more eloquent than what I just said. Um, yeah. In in the later chapters of the book, I, I do agree. Yeah, the the, the those questions in uh, the section on abolition, that kind of framing of non-reformist reforms, really, really essential. And one of those questions looks at reducing the technologies, tools and tactics available to immigration control, right? And sections, uh, well, chapter six and seven of the book, look at those technologies in a bit more specifics, um, particularly databases and algorithms. Uh, and you refer quite a lot to the complicity between states and big companies, and you identify a number of private companies uh, who are involved in that, both kind of arms manufacturers and private security firms, and big tech companies, you know, like Palantir, Amazon, IBM. Uh, and you refer to these as sites of protest, intervention, and action. I feel like these sorts of targets can be some of the most challenging for campaigners. Some of the reasons for that you outline in the book, um, you know, centrally their lack of accountability, their lack of shame. I also think there's a very different sort of inevitability attached to the way these companies develop and operate. You know, we in abolition are constantly talking about kind of shattering those inevitabilities uh, in the very overt coercive form or, or the, you know, the prison as an inevitable response to harm in society. But with technology, there's that kind of inevitability of progress, right? That this is something that is us moving forward. It is also heavily involved in that coercive element. You know, it comes in times of shock and crisis and the statistics that you cite, particularly when it, um, you know, the biometric data collection in Iraq and Afghanistan is shocking. Uh, but, you know, we, we've also seen some really inspirational resistance to some of the more traditional war puppeteers. I'm thinking of groups like Palestine Action um, confronting Elbit systems. But what do you think are the arenas for resistance when it comes to the types of data gathering and surveillance operations of both private companies and national and global institutions and the way that companies kind of do that work for the state and then are readily available when the state needs that information. So how, yeah, how, how do you see resistance for that playing out? Can it be done in the same kind of direct action way or what approach do you feel is necessary? That's a great question. I mean, I think Luke and I would both, um, and it hopefully comes through in the book that we're not kind of, we're not dogmatic. So we don't think that there is one way to get things done and actually I, I think we'd probably both say that it's problematic when everybody is deploying the same tactic or has the same focus so so I don't I don't think it's singular from that perspective and that's in part why the audience of the book is so broad because we agree we need direct action we also know there are radical infiltrators in NGOs and so on and so forth so it's really about trying to prompt people to think kind of wherever they're situated like what are you going to be able to do I mean I think when we look at tech activism in the United States, for example, we see tech workers as an amazing constituency. Um, you know, I, it, it's not a 
total victory that they've had at Google, but workers there have had a really significant impact on the kinds of contract um, that, the, that the company does and doesn't take up. It's still doing some really harmful things. And of course, there are the more insidious things that it does that aren't explicitly doing X for an arms manufacturer, but nevertheless, pressure from workers has had an impact in that context. So, and obviously they're increasingly unionizing and so on and so forth. So I think we need to recognize tech workers as an important constituency. Um, I don't think we can underplay the role of obviously kind of mass protest. Again, it's only a partial victory that can be rolled back, but sort of Amazon and what Amazon said about its use of facial recognition technology in the wake of kind of the uprisings after George Floyd was murdered. I mean, that's the kind of issue where sort of tech policy, human rights NGO people have kind of been sitting around for ages saying, oh, should we go for a facial recognition ban or should we go for saying it should be better regulated and blah, blah, blah. And actually this mass movement comes in and creates actually its own sense of inevitability, which is that your brand is gonna be completely toxic if you're just using facial recognition willy nilly. Again, it's not a complete victory, but it's something. And to be honest, I thought Amazon would have less shame than it did in that instance. So we can always be, we can always be surprised. But I think that, We've had a few interesting questions over the last week or so about kind of tech justice and data justice. And so again, I think it helps to come at this question from the perspective of obsolescence, because the reality is that, you know, if you look at an institution like the NHS, that, you know, for various reasons, can't do all of its own data management, some of those things structurally can be changed. But then when they look for data management solutions, who's there with the product, the lobbying heft, the slickness, it's Palantir. What if we lived in a world where Palantir was not the only purveyor of tech systems to states? Obviously, it's not the only one, but where do we get those kind of who's building the life affirming technology? Um, who's building the stuff that really is in service of human flourishing? And when we get to Utopia at the end of the book, there is quite a lot of tech in that Utopia, actually. There's different modes of transport. Um, you know, there are genetically modified seeds, there's, there are different kinds of healthcare. So, you know, we're really not technophobic, but I think, and we're not the people necessarily to do this dreaming because we're not technologists, but we really need to think about what are the infrastructures that we need? Like, how does it get funded? How do people get trained to make tech essentially for, for social good? Um, part of the issue is obviously the products, you know, Palantir has been founded by a white nationalist. That's obviously not going to produce tech that is in, in the collective good. But of course, the issue is also the ground of the world onto which tech is inserted. So yeah, you have to change the tech, but also for as long as states are a big market and for as long as the profit motive is what drives tech development and for as long as states are entities that sort and exclude and profile tech is not going to function for the social good. So yeah, we need different technology, but we also need to change the world and tech needs to be inserted kind of into a completely different context. So I think there's kind of really fertile ground for targeted campaigns against specific companies using an array of tactics. If we look at No Tech for Ice that's been run by Mehenti, that's been amazing. They're now targeting LexisNexis which is something that most lawyers use. It's an amazing legal database, but it's also powering deportation machine in the States. There are specific targeted actions that can be taken against tech companies, but also we have to, we need a broader vision about tech for, for social good. And I think for me in particular, having had to scrutinize the manifestos in whatever the last election was, even with a Jeremy Corbyn leadership, the tech vision was incredibly weak. It was something like public, the, the data should be held in public trusts. So like silent on the really coercive bits, nothing on facial recognition, nothing on automated decisions, but also then just like, yeah, public data trust, that's as far as we've got. And if, if, that's, what, if that's the policy platform of the progressive parties, we're really in trouble. Um, so we need the dreaming as well as the holding them back. Thank you. Um, yeah, Luke, I don't know if you have anything you'd like to add. Um, yeah, again, very comprehensive. I think 
really raises some interesting questions about what that tech justice looks like. But yeah, I think that that challenge of where that comes from, as with so many of these, it's, it's that, yeah, kind of addressing the fact or the inaccessibility of so many of these fields to maybe people involved in, in these movements. Um, but yeah, that definitely something to work with. I do think, yeah, that the, you know, part of what makes the kind of utopian section at the end so powerful is its integration of or reimagining of, of technologies in that way. Um, yeah, um, I would like to open up at this point to any other questions. If anybody does have questions, I'm happy to keep asking more. Um, but yeah, I, I would really love to hear if anybody um, you know, has any questions for Christian or any, any comments on anything that's been said so far. You know, I think we've had some really interesting challenges posed um, and you know, questions for all of us to think about um, that yeah, if anybody has any thoughts on, do either post in the chat or feel free to raise a hand or just unmute yourself and, and let us know if you would like to speak. Until anybody does that or while you have a think. Um, just yeah, on those last sections, um, on the interludes, I, I you know, I, I grew up reading a little bit of science fiction and things and then, you know, finding, you know, drawing towards both the kind of like heavy dystopia type, but also, you know, starting to think more about the yeah, radical reimagining of a, of a, of a better future. Um, and it also obviously reminded me a lot of <clears throat> Ola Ola Femi's great uh, experiment in imagining otherwise. And I feel that there's this real power in this literary form that you take on of, you know, imagination. And this ties into, you know, Mary McCarver's, you know, writing on abolition as experimentation, right? And literary or literature as so much art and creativity is a space for that type of imagination. I guess if I were to frame that as a kind of question, I'm interested in what kind of inspired you to get there, because I think that this type of work, both the dystopian and more utopian ones, requires some sort of imagining and kind of, yeah, creative influence, or I don't know, I, I'm intrigued as to what kind of encourage you to, to put those bits in because it's not the type of thing we necessarily get in this type of book. Yeah, um, well that's precisely the reason the last thing you said in a way it's because it's not something you normally get in, in this kind of book that we wanted to have a go. Um, when we were planning the book we were we were talking about you know this will be a, as Gracie said in the original WhatsApp message this will be a book which says why there shouldn't be any borders um, what makes it different is that it wants to, and particularly through abolition, it wants to affirm something that is already um, that is already perhaps existing at small scale. And we talk about hope in that way, you know, as something we want to, something that exists in the present as a potential, um, a kind of critical opening that could be prized open further, et cetera, moments of freedom or autonomy that we think could be expanded. Um, so the question always comes when you say you're an advocate of no borders or abolition of borders is, well, what would it look like? Um, I just can't imagine it, you know, and that people, people tend to ask that. And, and Verso, I remember also saying that, you know, they've, they've read books or commissioned books that were about immigration controls more, more broadly and about, uh, that made the argument somewhere, whether centrally or in the margins about, you know, all immigration controls being unjust. But no one had given a vision of what that would look like, etc. Um, so we always wanted to have something which tried to vision, uh, because our point is about a longer time frame, and not just a report on the latest, most you know, um, most terrible forms of bordering now, but a kind of a book which is yes, practical and hopefully useful to people who are doing stuff. Um, but also oriented by visions. We felt we had to try and give some account of some visions. Um, so we'd always said we'd do that. We were, Grace said we were meeting originally and trying to think about whether we'd watch certain films or think about, you know, art together, which, you know, I'm basically a charlatan when it comes to art. So I was very keen to learn and Grace is more literary than me. Um, and so that was nice. And we did begin that conversation um i was quite characteristically talking about you know 
long books that we could you know talk about that were historical that were about you know moments of freedom or mobility or you know marinage or something um and so we always wanted to do that but actually the writing of it uh we never really penciled down what we'd do and how we'd write it it was just there that we'd do it at the end somehow we'd put in these these utopia and dystopia a bordered world and a borderless utopia and it was gracie and i'll hand over to her because i think it's interesting to hear gracie talk about it as the author of those interludes um i obviously read over them and i wrote the bits around them maybe which say the significance of alberto's world and where our vision took us is, is in the dystopia was here and in the utopia we noticed that there isn't this and there is the, the, the different ways of relating to the family um the technology doesn't have centralized technologies don't have the same hold etc um so i did a bit of that underlining and writing around and, and offered the comments but gracie wrote the interludes um and i guess was must have been you know well you can talk about gracie but was a was a journey to to write in this way which for me is still remains uncharted territory yeah thanks luke um yeah so like luke says we'd set ourselves uh, we'd set ourselves this challenge of, of painting these portraits um and in part for me it did come a bit luke's been very generous it did also come for me from a place of procrastination um, because I was supposed to be writing other bits of the book, but they were so close to kind of my day to day work that it was just too much to then write about that too. And so I think part of it was my soul being like, what do I really want to be doing? And it was, it was writing fiction. Um, but we had chatted to our friend Adam Elliott Cooper, who had mentioned in the course of the, those guys writing Empire's Endgame that sometimes they would just set a timer for an hour and all just sit and write and kind of see what came out so that's what I did at home on my own just kind of set set the timer to see what came out and and the interludes came out essentially um because we those those subheadings border dystopia borderless utopia that was basically the task I was like this is what we need to express somehow so that's that's how they came out um in terms of sort of where they came from, um, I guess we, a, a really important thing about the book for both of us was to sort of really talk about the importance, the significance of new technologies, well, new and old technologies in kind of shaping and enabling coercive state power. So I think that was the point of writing The Borders Dystopia because there's an account of borders on which, and you'll see that in the book, we don't focus hugely on the spectacle like we're not we're not really big on camps and walls and people dying in the Mediterranean even though those things are obviously terrible um we really wanted to draw out and I think Luke in particular had been thinking about this kind of the ways in which the border actually wasn't simply getting harder it was following people around letting some things and some people move and becoming even more death making for others temporarily more permanently and so on. So I think that's what, what conceptually is underneath the border dystopia. That was what I was trying to animate. Um, but in terms of my literary influences, I, I am a fiction nerd in a, in a, you know, yeah, that's what, yes, yeah, what I studied for years. I had read, I, I think over the course of writing this book, I'd read a lot of George Saunders, obviously started out as a tech writer and writes really beautifully essentially about what it is to be human and to care for one another in a capitalist hellscape in a really funny and satirical way. Um, so George Saunders, I'd read Marge Piercy's Woman on the Edge of Time, Ursula K. Le Guin's The Dispossessed, um, and actually I'd read Marianne Macabre's, I think after we'd done the writing, but Marianne Macabre's Justice, that little, that little story as well. Um, and Lola's book, which is still like top of my to read this, hadn't come out yet when we were doing this writing. So yeah, lots of kind of, oh, and also Friday Black. Um, so yeah, it was really easy to write dystopia actually, because I think my head is up against it all the time. It's the kind of stuff I've had nightmares about since I was a kid. Utopia was more of a challenge. And I also think that that's why Utopia is fractured because it was difficult to write a really total unified utopia well i just don't think that's how it would be anyway um because in my head utopia is not hegemonic so anyway that was how the interludes that was how they came out they sort of just came out thank you 
Um, yeah, they're really powerful. And I think that I am part of that is the purpose for the dystopia is in itself so isolated. It, it's an isolated existence, whereas the utopia does create the opportunity of you, you need to have an interconnected world. Um, but thanks, very interesting. Um, yeah, we have a question, Shireen. I don't know if you would like to ask this yourself or you can happy to read it out. Um, I think it's a really important question. Okay, no problem. Um, so Shireen asks if um, you've had discussion or anybody here has had discussion about abolition with current prisoners, um, as she has been discussing this topic with prisoners serving life and was struck by how they do associate policing with protection. And this seems to be based on the violence they encounter in prison. Um, and so yeah, I would love to hear people's thoughts on that. And again, if anybody else does have any questions, do raise a hand or post in the chat. So, do you, do you want me to have a, have a go first, Gracie? Yeah, go for it. I'll go afterwards. Um, it's it's a it's a it's a good question. Um, we can think about it in terms of prison, and then just think about it in terms of borders as well. Because I suppose what you know what can happen in all sorts of uh, when you commit to all sorts of radical policies is you can speak to the people who might be most directly impacted and they cannot agree with you. And that, that happens all the time. And um, they cannot find your version very compelling and actually uh, find the version of the, the people who are locking them up partly compelling. Um, I spoke to lots of people and I'll speak from my experience who had spent time in prison and then been deported to Jamaica. And for example, one finding I found from a couple of people is that prison was, that they they, they say I needed it. Right. And, and you, you think about that and you think, and, and I write about that as an indictment of the opportunities that were available to them and of policing and of criminalization often that they were having such a difficult life on the outside that prison offered them a bit of space and a reprieve from a context which they were really struggling in. Obviously, that's not an argument against prison abolition, but it's one of those things you get in kind of conversations with people who uh, might have different worlds they're different totally different experiences of the things you're talking about that when you do say let's abolish police and prisons they might not immediately say oh yeah that makes total sense of course not all of the work that goes into making the police policing prisons so uh seem so kind of permanent and everywhere is immense i mean the amount of programs trying to avoid watching programs about cops um it's easy enough if you don't watch much TV, but if you want to keep up with BBC dramas, for example, that your parent, my parents are watching, then it's impossible. Um, the same is true, I think, and we'll just move on to that briefly with border abolition. Uh, there are many people who you meet in the immigration system who are compelled to think of themselves, uh, compelled to talk about themselves as, well, I'm not, I have met people who do this kind of thing. I have met people who, um, you know, don't really have a proper asylum claim or that those people who commit these kinds of offenses I'm not one of them. You know, people will obviously say, I'm not a murderer, therefore I shouldn't have been deported. People say things like that all the time. Um, and they don't always say the progressive line, which is, well, given the history of slavery and colonialism, I sh why should I be responsible for the X, Y, and Z? Or, uh, you know, the Caribbean is a place where billions of pounds of kind of tax avoidance flow through. And yeah, I'm the one being forced on a, you know, forced on a plane for selling drugs when I couldn't get a job. So people don't always say things like that. They say things that are more immediate to them. And I suppose the point of political education, like this kind of network and many others and people who uh, work with different kinds of groups and do political education work is you're trying to help people make connections so that they can see those kinds of things. Because most people, I mean, this is, this is like year one sociology. People read C. Wright Mills, The Sociological Imagination. I still like it. He says that most people understand, you know, their private troubles as the as the kind of effect of the things that they can see around them, um, the personalities and passions of those, the dramas that happen within families or elsewhere. And obviously, that's true for explaining why one person might do well at school, one person might end up in prison. It, it there is a kind of personal level, um, interpersonal histories, family histories, etc. Um, but they what they what they aren't able to do necessarily is to connect private troubles to public issues to big large scale things that are hard to understand that are abstract that we're deliberately led not to understand mm -hmm. and the challenge of kind of sociological imagination i would say political education more broadly is to help people see the connections between the things that most deeply impact them and the broader set of 
in, institutional um, historical forces that determine them. And so no wonder people who are in prison might think the police protect them. And if there's a complex layer like you're talking about, where they fear for their own personal safety and the only thing, the only thing that they can find, which in with very limited options might make them feel slightly safer, is recourse to the same police. Then that's no surprise either. The, the prison is a site which, you know, creates all sorts of vulnerabilities and violences for those who are forced to live there. So, um, yeah, that's a very, that's, that's the broad answer. It's a familiar thing that's going to come up again and again, but the struggle, I guess, is to, um, is to use political education to make, to help people see the same things that we find compelling, if they really are worth fighting for. Thanks, Luke. Um, I was just gonna add kind of my personal experience because you asked. Um, again, I think, it, yeah, over the course of, I think it was really working on the proposal. I was supporting someone very close to me through a 10 week trial and then subsequent yeah incarceration and we had a lot of conversations about kind of how what that person thought about the situation that they'd ended up in and what might have been different it, at no point well in fact one of the most one of yeah one of their reflections was that the police never did anything to make them feel safer there were kind of really specific sort of threats to life from third parties and like the police were kind of like we'll stick one of these egg things on your window and if anyone breaks the window it will go off um or like maybe we'll take someone close to you who's also in some kind of trouble into custody for their own protection but we're not gonna do anything and of course the police are not equipped to deal with like any of the any of anything any of the conditions that were generating all of this violence um, so yeah, my very personal experience is that, um, yeah, there has, with that person in particular, was that there was always an understanding that the police were not there to do anything to support them or us as people close to them. Um, I, and I think it's because the, that situation, yeah, that was a kind of three year situation and obviously it's on the afterlife of incarceration is 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 really really long you know that someone I'm always going to be supporting so that's part of why I haven't in the last few years been doing kind of broader uh kind of prisoner solidarity stuff because yeah I've been with that person very close to me um but yeah it was kind of a priori the police are not gonna but you know we grew up in a situation where like my family is very mixed and Grew up in a situation, you know, my mum in the 70s, my mum is mixed, my grandma's white, you know, police would knock on the door and my mum would open the front door and they would come in and trample all the clean washing and then my grandma would come down the stairs and they'd be like, oh sorry, and pick it all back up. Like that's the thing, it's, it's been that blatant for that long. Um, so, you know, none of us were ever going to think that the police were there for us, so. Thank you both for those answers. Um, yeah, uh, I had a lot to think about that. I think certainly the kind of comment on there is an educational aspect to that. You know, how can we generate a consciousness that it is, you know, a, a system level kind of consciousness as well. Um, and it means changing a lot of things. Yeah, but again, it come, I think a lot of it does come back to this kind of question of inevitability and addressing something that because it's there and it's the current way of dealing with those things and it is so normalized and as Luke said you know TV you know, propaganda does a great job of that and, and with borders it, it's far e even greater right you know that there's it's such a normalized such an ever-present thing that it can feel inescapable but that doesn't necessarily mean it is um another question from Marlon would you like to read it out or would you like us to No problem. Um, so, Luke and Gracie, do you think the relative dominance of dystopian births, since utopian futures imagined in popular art, impacts our ability or tendency to imagine a better future? Yes, but even though I'm someone who spent far too long in in the university, um, this question is it's a great question, and it's kind of it's one that I want to do. You know 
a course on because in a way it's about content about popular art and i don't know enough about it i think it just you know it's so i'd have to only speak in a way you know without any authority but i suppose it feels true and it also feels that the reason there is so much dystopian popular art is partly because uh people are aware <laughs> that the stakes are very high and there's a lot of unsettling moves particularly if we think about tech i imagine Marlon is also thinking about technologies as I am too, and the ways we represent those. Um, obviously, there are tropes that once set then take on a life of their own um, around technologies, but still people are, the speed of change, et cetera, and the, the sheer capacity for technologies to sense in new ways, gather information, process information, means that there's, you know, there's no, no surprise there. Um, that some of the images that come out in popular art are very dystopian. I think the challenge of utopian futures, I don't know if that's, I suppose what I'm saying is I don't know whether utopianism is always harder or whether the fact that it's harder is a sign that we're in quite bleak times where hope is always a challenge. And that has been my personal experience, politically, emotionally, of trying to summon hope from um, when it can feel difficult not hopeless because hope is always there's always hope um i think that you know, we, we should ask gracie about how it is to how it is to write those things for me it's also a, a kind of um sign of the political moment where you know historic world fel uh, kind of decimation of the left and very new technologies being repurposed and kind of authoritarian governments currently in the ascendancy hopefully not for much longer um but that might be why popular art is also, and this is where you need the art theory people, <laughs> um, the relationship between, you know, what those, how the images in art are related to technological and historic shifts in statecraft and business, etc. But Gracie, I'll defer to you because it's a hard one. It's a hard one. I love it. It's really activate. I'm a philosopher by training, so it's like really activating my aesthetics paper from like 10 years ago. Um, it's a great question. Also, I feel that I, Luke, we've definitely had conversations about art stuff where I feel like I've been quite annoying. But so case in point, the cover of the book. So like I, I feel like art can be utopian without explicitly depicting utopia. I think that's a really important thing to kind of just, yeah, to, to start from that point of departure. And the cover of the book kind of when our editor Rosie asked us about kind of just inspirations for the book cover, I think this is where I was being annoying because I was being obscure. But one of the images that came to my mind when I think about utopia, I think about fauve landscapes. Um, which are kind of really trippy, like really trippy primary colours, really bright reds, blues, golds. And there's a particular fauve landscape that's, um, my grandma just has a print on the wall in her house, which is funnily enough of a place that I went to as an adult north of Marseille that I really, really love. I go there every year and I'd never connected the two. Um, but I think that that's utopian. I think that like, the pointillist, you know, like bathers at Auvergne, of people just luxuriating in pastel, all of the impressionists, like to, to me, all of that is really utopian. Um, and I suppose those works of art are, aren't even necessarily depicting futures, they're depicting kind of warped presence and otherwise. So I think, you know, in that sense, utopia in art is where you find it. I think for me, the kind of more salient thing would be around temporality um, because I think if all you're thinking about is the next five years or if you're in the temporality of the news cycle or the next election it's really hard to imagine anything but dystopia like that for me is what is where the dystopia trap is um, and I think as soon as I look on a different time horizon I can imagine all kinds of things <laughs> Um, so I feel like that, that to me is kind of the more salient utopia, dystopia axis. And I think that's why non-reformist reforms are so important because that helps you reverse engineer your way back into, okay, and what are we going to do right now that gets us to that place that we think we see in five, 10, 15 years, but also maybe tomorrow, because you just never know kind of what ruptures are going to occur and how we'll be able to take advantage of them. Um, so yeah, I don't see a huge amount of um, 
dystopia actually in popular art, but also maybe we're looking at different things. Really, really appreciate that question and, and, and those answers. Um, and yeah, that, that statement, oh, big answer. But, um, just, yeah, I wanted to just get on that, you know, hope as the refusal of inevitability, as you say in the book, right? That, that's, and that comes across in, in any sort of artistic representation of anything hopeful, right? It, it's that kind of something can be different, um, which is really beautiful. Um, if I, is it okay if I read it? I, we're pretty short on time. Um, are you okay to do one more question and then we will do a quick reading or? I'm, I'm up for doing it, but it might be best for us to not read it because it's lot, It's really interesting. It works as a comment as well. Thank you for it. Um, no, I think it's worth, I would think it's worth giving a go at, at definitely the first part. The second part is just a really, yeah, it's maybe too big, but it's it's really interesting question. Um, Maybe we can just try and give a short a short answer on the on the data chapter because I think um, Gracie covered it a little bit, but those sections were born out of Gracie's work. So hopefully she can say a little bit to that because Gracie's worked on issues of tech, human rights, um, and been thinking about an abolitionist perspective to them. Uh, broadly, to come back to Gracie's point from before what we were trying to think about that was perhaps missing and the art is only an opening. It really is not the kind of, oh, all you need to do is read these two chapters and then you know the state of the art on how tech works at the border. It's rather like neither of us are technologists. Gracie has some experience in the policy sector trying to um, trying to work on fighting fires and fighting back against some of the some of the worst end of these technological developments, you know, facial recognition, automated decision making, um, the private companies we talked about earlier, um, Palantir, etc. I think what what we were committed to though was responding to the fact that the border is not usefully thought of as a hard uh, hard border always a wall or Europe as a fortress and actually thinking about the ways in which mobilities are regulated so that we know who and where everyone is and what they're doing and can give and take away give different rights at different points that, that to become virtual they rely on modern technologies of identification surveillance sensing obviously there's a long much longer conversation a much broader a conversation in several literatures about about these kinds of technologies and new forms of power we wanted to think about how that works at the border to offer a short statement on uh, with some examples on how the future, the near future and the present of the border are so fundamentally about investments in data, in new forms of organizing data and databases and the algorithms which try and process that information. So this was our attempt to that. It's an opening, we, does, we don't think it has enough on affirming what alternatives people would have, uh, not just of escape and disruption, but of you know new ways of organizing the information that we actually, that we actually need um so that's that's there obviously you'll get to it when you when you read it but that was why we put it in and i think um for us it was a for me i learned a lot by trying to do it and hopefully it will encourage and spark other people who who know more to build out and to write you know to write other things about how we can how we can offer something uh in this realm and the, the other bit yeah I, I don't think we have we quite have time but we we certainly move between our positionalities as academic um, NGO worker um, in conversations with the kind of radical no borders activists and hope that this conversation has something for people who have to wear those hats too or who wear different ones of them at different times and for those of us like like everyone who are on the move trying to work out how to change things um, yeah I think I'll leave it there we could feel free to follow up uh, with us if you want to explore some of those questions because obviously this uh, might feel a bit clipped for those massive and very interesting questions. Thanks, Luke. Uh, yeah, just on the tech question, Luke's covered kind of our, our motivation for putting it in the book. I suppose my personal experience, I'm, you know, I was at Liberty for a long time. I ended up working on tech stuff because the amazing person who works on tech left and then I was left to just do all of Liberty's lobbying on the data protection bill. Um, so that was kind of me in at the deep end. 
and there were a lot of things that I read, which I realized that like not everyone is going to have the time or luxury of reading, or you might read these bits of our book and then want to read more. I read um, Automating Inequality by Virginia Eubanks, um, Algorithms of Oppression by Safia Noble, Dark Matters by Simone Brown, um, Weapons of Math Destruction, Kathy O'Neill, and um, The Rise of Big Data Policing by Andrew Guthrie Ferguson. So I had to do like a little crash course essentially in tech. <laughs> um, and so that's where some of this learning comes from. But crucially, I was in that space, you know, this was the data protection bill that introduced an immigration exemption. And I was basically the only person in the kind of NGO policy space who had a background in migrant justice stuff and also had the kind of human rights background and dexterity with the tech stuff. And even I basically was getting spoken down to, not even I, it's not a surprise, but I was just really getting spoken down to by a load of white tech bros. And I'm obnoxious enough to have been like, no, you're wrong and I'm gonna do it this way. But that's quite a thing to have to deal with. And if there had been a critical mass of us, and if actually, you know, on a lot of other issues, when I've been in NGOs, yes, it's taken an NGO to kind of read the draft bill and figure out what the thing is. But when the ecosystem is good, you can kind of say to a load of radical people, this thing is coming down the pipeline, decide what you want to do about it. That's a bit what happened with the, with the policing bill. And so what it would be amazing would be to be in a position where like somebody sees something coming and actually there's just a level of digital literacy that means that everybody can mobilize however they want to, rather than NGOs or people like me having to do this kind of elite work of translation and so on and so forth, because actually that power is in other people's hands. And actually then you're in a position to completely shift the terms of the debate because it's not being led by the technologies at the digital rights organizations so the technologists so that that's just a bit about kind of the motivation for the data and algorithms chapter and i mean yeah all i'll say on um on kind of where we were positioned when we were writing this book i was intent on the fact that when this book came out i would not be associated with any institution um that ultimately that was really important to me my experience of NGOs has been very varied, but in many ways it has been very silencing. And the last thing I wanted to do was have to kind of water down or temper or present differently anything that was in this book, having been told for a long time, you can't say this, you can't say that, oh, the Daily Mail will be on at us if you do this, blah, blah, blah. Like this book was really kind of, for me, being able to speak freely, um, but it's not, you know, it's not all black and white, but it would not have been possible really to have this book out and be in the context of, of, of an institution, an NGO anyway, I don't think. I can just say we're really grateful that you were able to speak freely because yeah, it's, it's resulted in something really, really powerful and really helpful. Um, yeah, um, and just also on that, you know, uh, I encourage everybody here to follow both Gracie and Luke on Twitter. Um, you know, I really do keep an eye out on what's next for both of them. Um, I don't know if we have time for you to talk about NLP. I mean, that's fine. We'll all be keeping an eye out. Um, thanks, everybody, uh, for coming. Before we wrap up, we are going to have a uh, brief reading from the end of the book, um, which is going to just finish us off. Um, but just, yeah, I'd just like to thank again Luke and Gracie for giving us your time and everybody for coming along, everybody who posted questions or comments. And just, yeah, it's been really lovely hearing such great and helpful information from Luke and Gracie. And, to share that with you all and we hope to do more of these in the future um so yeah do keep an eye out for those too and i'll pass over to you guys now thank you thanks so much luke was there anything you wanted to say no you've done a thanks in the chat uh, yeah cool Just thank you everyone again out loud thank you so much for coming when it's super hot we really appreciate it yeah we have both just been really touched that so many people have just turned up to hear us chat about the book um it's wicked so i'm gonna read a really short bit from page 169 chapters interlude futures 2. um so the future like the present will not be easy but we can act now to open greater possibilities for ourselves and for those who come next this requires dreaming and imagining and then using these visions to orient us in the present it requires us to think carefully about what borders do in the world now, 
and to seek to undermine the connected forms of violence and closure that make them seem so necessary and permanent. It means rejecting the dreary and paralyzing politics of reformism and being bold enough to say that seemingly immovable and eternal features of our world, like capitalism, prisons, war, the nuclear family and nation states are unjust and unsatisfying and that we can get rid of them. It means stepping out of political abstraction and into the tumult, mass and joy of organizing and campaigning, moving towards the utopias that we imagine and need and living in ways that prefigure them. Ultimately, border abolition will be central to any revolutionary political programme. And if we cannot see that, we have already lost in the struggle to imagine liv livable futures. We hope that this book can contribute to the nourishing of our varied and colourful dreams towards those better worlds. So yeah, thanks so much for coming, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye, everyone.